morning year six it's monday the 25th of january 2021 so hopefully this morning you've done a little bit of multiplying fractions just to recap on what we learned on wednesday last week and now you've had a little break and you're going to do some independent english so let's begin this week we are going to do some poetry and we're going to specifically be learning about classical poetry and narrative poetry and the reason we're doing both is because the poem that we're going to focus on actually covers both it's a classical poem which means it's quite old and it's very famous and it's also a narrative poem because it tells a story let's take a look at it so in this lesson, you're going to independently investigate the meaning of unfamiliar words. How are you going to do that? You're going to use research and dictionary skills. Why? We're doing this to understand the poem we're about to read. So you will come across some unfamiliar words in the poem. And your job today, before our maths lesson at 11.25, is to find out what they mean so that you then are prepared for our 130 English lesson where we will be analysing this poem in more detail. So the poem, it's called The Highwayman and it's by a writer and poet called Alfred Noyes and here he is just there. So he was born in Staffordshire in England in 1880 and he began writing poetry when he was a student at Oxford University. So The Highwayman is one of his most famous poems, but what exactly is or was a highwayman? So a highwayman, back in Alfred Noyes' day, which is the 19th century, and also in the later half of the 18th century, in the 1700s, they were robbers. Highwaymen were criminals, and often what they were famous for doing, what their line of crime was, was to mug or steal from people who were travelling on the road or on the highway, hence the name Highwayman. And they were usually on horses so they could make a quick getaway and chase coaches or horse-drawn carts. And they would take what they could by using really the threat of violence. They often had weapons and often they would hurt people. So they would take jewellery, they would take money, anything they could get their hands on. Because the roads and the highways weren't protected, and there certainly wasn't any um, police form or anything like that back in the time of the highwaymen. So, lots of highwaymen tended to be quite well educated or intelligent, and that's because in order to be a successful highwayman, you would need to know where to find these horse-drawn coaches and carriages, and you need to know where they would be, what road they would be on, so that you could get as much um, money and jewellery as you could. But also, highwaymen often ended up being servants of large households and estates because they were really envious of their masters, the people they served. They were in the perfect place to find out where these men and their rich friends were going. And they would eavesdrop and listen in on these conversations between their masters and their rich friends. And then when these rich friends left, the highwayman or the servant would follow them all disguised and commit the crime, steal what they could from this wealthy friend of their masters. So really, highwaymen were not good people. This poem, however, actually makes you feel quite sorry for the highwayman characterises by the end because it's quite a tragic end and it's all to do with a romance. So we're going to have a read of it now. You'll hear the lyrics or the lines of the poem over some music. As it's read to you and as you follow it with your eyes, I would like you to make a note of any words that you don't know or can't work out what they mean, because that will be really important, because after this you're going to find the definition of them. OK, here it goes. The High Woman by Alfred Noyes the wind was a torrent of darkness among the gusty trees. The moon was a ghostly galleon tossed upon cloudy seas. The road was a ribbon of moonlight over the purple moor, and the highwayman came riding, riding, riding. The highwayman came riding up to the old inn door. He'd a French cocked hat on his forehead, a bunch of lace at his chin. 
a coat of the claret velvet and breeches of brown doe skin. They fitted with never a wrinkle. His boots were up to the thigh, and he rode with a jeweled twinkle, his pistol but a twinkle, his rapier hilt a twinkle, under the jeweled sky. Over the cobbles he clattered and clashed in the dark inn yard. He tapped with his whip on the shutters, but all was locked and barred. He whistled a tune to the window, and who should be waiting there but the landlord's black-eyed daughter? Bess, the landlord's daughter, plaiting a dark red love knot into her long black hair. And dark in the dark old inn yard, a stable wicket creaked where Tim the ostler listened. His face was white and peaked, his eyes were hollows of madness, his hair like moldy hay. But he loved the landlord's daughter, the landlord's red lipped daughter. Dumb as a dog, he listened, and he heard the robber say, One kiss, my bonny sweetheart. I'm after a prize tonight. But I shall be back with the yellow gold before the morning light. Yet if they press me sharply and harry me through the day, then look for me by moonlight. Watch for me by moonlight. I'll come to thee by moonlight, though hell should bar the way. He rose upright in the stirrups. He scarce could reach her hand. But she loosened her hair in the casement. Her face burnt like a brand as the black cascade of perfume came tumbling over his breast. And he kissed its waves in the moonlight. Oh, sweet black waves in the moonlight. Then he tugged at his rein in the moonlight and galloped away to the west. He did not come at the dawning. He did not come at noon. And out of the tawny sunset before the rise of the moon, when the road was a gypsy's ribbon looping the purple moor, a redcoat troop came marching, marching, marching. King George's men came marching up to the old inn door. They said no word to the landlord. They drank his ale instead. But they gagged his daughter and bound her to the foot of her narrow bed. Two of them knelt at her casement, with muskets at their side. There was death at every window, and hell at one dark window, for Bess could see through her casement the road that he would ride. They had tied her up to attention with many a sniggering jest. They had bound a musket beside her with the muzzle beneath her breast. Now keep good watch, and they kissed her. She heard the doomed man say, look for me by moonlight. Watch for me by moonlight. I'll come to thee by moonlight, though hell should bar the way. She twisted her hands behind her, but all the knots held good. She writhed her hands till her fingers were wet with sweat or blood. They stretched and strained in the darkness, and the hours crawled by like years, till now on the stroke of midnight, cold on the stroke of midnight, the tip of one finger touched it. The trigger, at least, was hers. The tip of one finger touched it. She strove no more for the rest. Up she stood, up to attention, with the barrel beneath her breast. She would not risk their hearing. She would not strive again, for the road lay bare in the moonlight, blank and bare in the moonlight, and the blood of her veins in the moonlight throbbed to her love's refrain. Clot, 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 had they heard it? The horse hooves ringing clear. Clot, 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 in the distance. Were they deaf that they did not hear? Down the ribbon of moonlight, over the brow of the hill, the highwaymen came riding, 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 and the redcoats looked to their priming. She stood up straight and still. Clot, clot in the frosty silence, clot, clot in the echoing night. Nearer he came and nearer, her face was like a light. Her eyes grew wide for a moment. She drew one last deep breath. Then her finger moved in the moonlight. Her musket shattered the moonlight. Shattered her breast in the moonlight and warned him with her death. He turned, he spurred to the westward, he did not know who stood, bowed with her head or the musket, drenched with her own blood. Not till the dawn he heard it, 
and his face grew grey to hear how best the landlord's daughter, the landlord's black-eyed daughter, had watched for her love in the moonlight and died in the darkness there. Back he spurred like a madman, shrieking a curse to the sky, with the white road smoking behind him and his rapier brandished high. Blood red were his spurs to the golden noon, wine red was his velvet coat, when they shot him down on the highway, down like a dog on the highway, and he lay in his blood on the highway, with the bunch of lace at his throat. And still, of a winter's night, they say, when the wind is in the trees, when the moon is a ghostly galleon tossed upon cloudy seas, when the road is a ribbon of moonlight over the purple moor, a highwayman comes riding, riding, riding. A highwayman comes riding up to the old inn door. Over the cobbles he clatters and clangs in the dark inn yard and he taps with his whip on the shutters, but all is locked and barred. He whistles a tune to the window, and who should be waiting there but the landlord's black-eyed daughter, Bess, the landlord's daughter, plaiting a dark red love knot into her long black hair. So Year 6, that was the full poem of The Highwayman by Alfred Noyes. And if you struggle to understand fully the plot, don't worry at this point, because this task, your glossary task, is actually designed to help you understand it a little bit more. And then when we come back together at 1.30 after lunch, you will hopefully understand it even more as we talk through the plot the plot and summarise each stanza. Okay, so your glossary task now for the rest of your morning just before maths at 11.25 is to create a glossary of the poem. So a glossary is obviously a little bit like a dictionary, but a not it's never a full dictionary. You find it at the back of books usually, and it helps you to define words that you're not familiar with. So if you haven't already circled or made notes on any of the unfamiliar language, go back and do that now. And I want you to then investigate those words that you've noted down and create a glossary for the poem. Try to research the words first, obviously, rather than guessing. But if you do struggle to find them in a normal dictionary or online, try the dictionary help sheets that I've placed in today's PDF. And on the next pages, I'll give you a sneak peek. Here we go. And try to find the words you can't necessarily find through your own independent research. What I'd like you to do is write down a minimum of at least seven words you don't understand. So, for example, you may not understand, let's say, what the word breaches means. So once you've found it, you will write the word down in one column. Belt properly and then in the next column you might want to use a different colour for this if you have different colours just to highlight the word class so it's a noun and what does it mean I'm going to try a different colour again so breeches are trousers that end just below the knee okay so that's what I need you to do, to do. Preferably with all the words that you don't understand, but I understand that there might be quite a few. So I'm going to need a minimum of seven words from you. Obviously, if it still doesn't help your understanding of the poem, you might need to go ahead and search some more words and hopefully come at 1.30 with an idea of what is in the poem and who's who. Okay, so that's your task. Create a glossary of the unknown language in the highwayman. The word, the word class and its definition, and hopefully that will clarify the meaning of the poem for you. I will see you at one, no, I'll see you at 11.25 actually, because we have maths soon. And please bring your glossary, not to maths, but to our English session at 1.30 today. See you later, bye bye.